But uh, let's open up with prayer. So, Heavenly Father, it's a neat little group we got here going, and we're just thank, so thankful for it. We just uh, continue to pray for your blessings as we study your word. Blessings on each one of us in our ministry. Blessings upon our congregation, upon me, and all who are in leadership at, at Emmanuel uh, to the end uh, that we might equip the saints for ministry and be what you have called us to be. Blessings uh, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go to it. And I'll open up my Olive Tree Bible app, and you can open up if you want of your Bibles, if you would like, to First John, I think around chapter four. I sometimes get confused. I'm talking about cats and dogs and things, but I think that's about where we were uh, last night. We uh, got off on a, another one of our tangents, but that's that's part of what we do when we're together night after night, we find out who we sleep with, don't we? <laughs> we're talking, uh, those of you who weren't here yet last night, uh, we were asking, uh, do you sleep with your dog or cat if you have one? Uh, that, that was what I meant. And, uh, and we found out some information that was very useful of a sermon fodder for later on. So here we are. I think I'm going to start back on chapter four, verse one, and we'll just go right through to verse seven real quick. Uh, if we have some things we haven't covered, we can bring them up. Um, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out from the world. So th this is the thing that the apostles keep talking about. They talk about the spirits they talk about what's going on that's coming into us that aren't human. And then they talk about the human sin. There's both a battle that's spiritual and a battle that's carnal. Verse two, it says, by this, you know, the spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So right away, he's talking about this uh, spiritual world that is uh, infiltrating, creating havoc among us human beings to dissuade us from following Jesus and to enlist us in the demonic, the army that goes nowhere. And... He uses the term antichrist, which is the term for an end time figure, but the spirit of which is already present in the world, in the churches, comes out of the churches. And so he says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. And um, he who was in you is greater than he was in the world. Now they're from the world. They speak from the world and the world listens to them. But we're from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there's a lot of stuff that we, we uh, began to talk about last time uh, in there. Um, any comments on these first six verses? So uh, let me ask you, what are the two, uh, for a measuring stick for the Christian church and its leaders, what are the two measuring sticks, the two tests of a true teacher in the Christian church, according to these verses? If they confess that Jesus Christ is... Confess that Jesus Christ what is of god jesus christ is of god who has has come in the flesh that's come right come in the flesh. coming in the flesh the coming in the flesh is the deal 
because the Gnostics believed that he was a spiritual being, an emanation. That, they didn't, that was not the quarrel in the church. The quarrel in the church was that he was a human being. For us, the issue was whether he was God. For us, the question is always, was he really God? For them, the question was, was he really human? Why would that be the case? Why would they question whether he was really human, do you think? Because someone that was human wouldn't have the power. Well, they want to question whether it's really human because God saved the humanity through Jesus Christ by making him a man. And when he was raised from the dead, the, the, then that was God's imprint on his final plan that human, humanity would be redeemed and saved and be in heaven with him. And these spirits have been condemned to hell. As it says in the book of Revelation, you know, their time, their, their time is short. They were thrown out of heaven and they were eventually condemned to the lake of fire. And that's, if you look in the book of Revelation, that's where they're going to end up. And they know that just as well as yeah. we do. Yes. The fact that Jesus was human and that he was raised is God's way of saying, I have, I have saved humanity starting from the all those who were in the garden of eden all the way through first john chapter 4 verse 1 and following so this is the inexplicable plan that was prophesied about but it was not completely understood even by the demonic uh world until jesus came if it would have been understood they would have quenched it but they didn't understand it and so they did everything they could to put jesus to death which is exactly what God wanted, that Jesus be put to death because the cross was going to be his glory. That's yes. what God says. The cross is his glory. They could not figure that one out, and then yet they did because Jesus came for two roles. One, to put an end to death that we might have eternal life by destroying sin. And secondly, to kick Satan into the lake of fire, right? And all the demonic Get rid of them so they're not around to pester us anymore. Two things. And, and Satan, when, whenever the demons appeared to Jesus, they called him the most high God. And they were the only ones to do that. Everyone else would say, teacher, rabbi, a demon comes out, say, oh, most high God, what do you want with us? The only ones that really knew that he was most high God, they couldn't figure out what's he doing in the flesh? Why is he becoming flesh? And then the Gnostics that are coming into the church are saying, What's he doing in the flesh? He couldn't have been really in the flesh because the flesh is bad. Flesh is sinful. The spirit is good. He only appeared to be in the flesh. And so that's what they were teaching. And that's what the demonic spirits were trying to get people to believe. So they didn't believe in the crucifixion. Uh, this whole thing of modelism and, and uh, serenthism, whatever the, what that word is, where it, the Christ that came into Jesus at his baptism came out of Jesus before the crucifixion. These are all heresies back then that the early church fathers talk about. That's the first test that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. The second test shown in verses five and six is that the true teacher speaks God's word following the apostolic doctrine. Nothing has changed. John makes a point of it. Nothing has changed from 30 AD to 95 AD. It's the same. Not one word changes book of Revelation. He makes a point of saying, don't add or subtract anything. Remember? Those are the two tests of a true teacher. And then he goes on to talk about how the spirit is a spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth is one that brings us into a love relationship. Anything else on verses one through six? Also powerful. Let's get on to verses seven through seven through uh, the end of the chapter. I'm, I'm gonna read the whole thing. And uh, there's a lot here and you may have questions. I have some uh, background information for you if you're interested. Beloved, let us love one another, 
for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the, the satisfaction for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he is God. And so we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also we are in this world. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. Oh, Okay, so it's a whole section on uh, why Christians love. And the Gnostics, the ones that, that believed in um, a defining love is coming from within someplace, never defined the source of love as coming from within God. And that, that was the thing. They, they, they saw it emanating from other sources. We define agape love originating from God. He first loved us and through his Holy Spirit gives us the capacity to imperfectly in this world share agape love, selfless love. So, so verse 9 says, why Christians love, it's an obligation to follow the pattern of sacrificial love. We might live through him. And then in verse 12, another reason why we love, uh, love is the heart of the Christian witness. And then in verses 13 through 16, we see it's a assurance for us. And then it's also um, confidence in the time of judgment down there in verses 17 through 20. Okay, what comments do you have in this, these a couple paragraphs on love? I'd like to I'd like to go down to there's no fear in love on uh, 18 because I feel like I have fallen so short of this this uh, you're on mute again rolling oh, there's so many fears that are live that creep into my life and uh, it basically says that if you have fear your love has not been perfected in you for fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And there's a lot of fears in my life, I know, that sneak in. So can you can you name for, for me one fear that's in your life? 
all financial issues uh, are, are a big part of our our uh, our problem with our business. Um, other fears have to do with uh, uh, our grandchildren and my and my own children have they have they moved away? You know, and um, and then other fears have to do with um, friends who uh, aren't saved. What was that last statement? Friends who are not saved. So what do you, what is a fear? What do you consider it? Why do you say it's a fear rather than a concern? Well, I've always anticipated negative outcomes and uh, could always like see them so clearly and then trying and not and then living with that is always uh, an issue for me. I just I just sometimes get very negative. Mm -hmm. I think so it was um, um, Mark Twain who said that um, an atheist. All, all of the fears that he had, um, he's had so many fears and hardly any of them that he suffered from, but hardly any of them are came to fruition. <laughs> and that's from an atheist. Uh, you know, I think there is for all of us a sense in which we are, are deeply troubled over things. Uh, most of which is beyond our control. We can't do anything but probably make it worse, <laughs> but we're concerned about it, deeply concerned about it because we love the people over whom we're concerned, about whom we're concerned. But I don't know that that's a fear. I, I had found myself praying very, very earnestly like, like two nights ago that God would not allow thermonuclear uh, event to happen in this world. One of the hardest things to do is to let go, isn't it? It is. Can I add something? Yeah. So when I went for my first lung transplant, I was going for a high risk lung and um, I really didn't want to, but then I said, you know, I'm just gonna let God be in control. And uh, I totally gave it to God. And that could have meant that I would die right away after the lung transplant. I would have had only a month to live. or I would have been in the hospital for several months, a high risk lung, usually you're in for six months or more. But then it didn't work out and I just went, praise God, <laughs> you know, I, I, and it was hard at first, but then I just, I just gave it to God. But the, the, the uh, cross reference to the verse that uh, he was talking about, Roley, there is no fear in love is Romans 8, uh, 15. And I just looked that up and it's a good reference, Roley. I like to do cross references because sometimes when we read God's word, it's always good to have a second verse to kind of find out. <laughs> you're on you're on mute. I'd like to know what it is. Can somebody read it? Yeah, I had it. I just here. I just closed it. I'm sorry. Well, you know, it's kind of an the age old thing though of, of with the Christian is like if you if you are uh, sinning or if you have doubts when you die or something, does that mean you're not going to heaven or something? You know, we have fears of that. Like, you know, will I not measure up at the right time or something? We refuse to believe that God is almost as God has given us that gift already and there's nothing we have to do to earn it. But it creates a fear. So, um... Romans 8.15 comes from a section that says holiness, a duty. And um, the verse ahead of it says, for, for all are who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. And then verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship when we cry, Abba, Father. So in other words, He's our father. He's going to take care of us. We don't need to fear. And when you think about that, he's the best father of all. 
You know, he will, he, you can contact him 24 hours a day and he's always there. He will never, you know, goof. <laughs> never lets us down. Never lets us down. There's a better way of saying it. <laughs> um, that reminds me that um, one of the fears that I would have is that because I, because I'm fearful of things, I'm doubtful of whether I actually have Christ in me and the love of God in me. But I heard a wonderful sermon, Marilyn, and it was like, if we cry, Abba, Father, that is the, that is the spirit of Christ in you. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a wonderful thing that we can always call out. I'll have to tell you, I was in Denver before my transplant helping Melanie. I was flying. I'd flown in and a taxi driver. We got stuck in the snow and the wheels were turning and I just said, Jesus, help us. And all of a sudden his wheels started turning and he goes, you can come in my taxi anytime, ma'am. <laughs> and he, we can, we can call out to him. It was, I was just chuckling in the back seat and he was so kind because the doors to the Marriott were closed because of all the homeless. And I gave him a nice tip and he goes, I'll wait till the person comes. I'm not gonna leave you, you'll die out here in the snow. But they do lock all the doors to the hotels now because um, that Marriott's right across from from the hospital, but there's a lot of homeless in Denver. So it took about 10 minutes for the person to come to unlock the door. And it was two in the morning or so. And uh, no, he was a very, that, that was his last drive, but I'll never forget him. You can come with me anytime. So we can call out at any time, any moment to our, to our father in heaven, because <laughs> he's on duty 24 <laughs> seven. So the point that, that I'm, would make, and I have preached about this quite a few times, is that we cannot allow our feelings to be mistaken for faith or lack of faith. Feelings fluctuate based on a lot of different reasons. And some of them have to do with our own uh, makeup. But uh, if we trust God rather than our feelings, then that is what the, John is talking about. And if we have faith in the Lord, uh, then no matter what the feelings are, we trust that we have a God who is over our feelings. God made us to have feelings, didn't he? And what he wants to do is to put those, harness those feelings in such a way as they're productive. And the next section that he talks about deals with just that issue, how we can become overcomers for the Lord. Do you want to go to that right now, maybe? So let's go to back to the uh, Bible study. And we're now into uh, chapter five. And in chapter five there, it, uh, it says this. Who, everyone who believes, not feels, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now who is it that overcomes the world? except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. So if you look closely at what this is being, what is being stated here, you notice that, uh, that John uses this term overcomer. And he uses the uh, three qualities that mark an overcomer. And this term overcomer, by the way, is used uh, by John 21 times in the letters and in the book of Revelation of the 24 times in the New Testament, 21 of the 24 times. And of those uh, at times, he uses it to mean three things. The first, uh, the first sign of one who is an overcomer is found in verse one, and that is saving faith. So if we have saving faith, Jesus is Lord, Abba, Father, as you said, 
then you are an overcomer. It, it trumps your fears. The second thing an overcomer uh, embodies in verse one is love. We love God, verse two. And, and the third thing is obedience. We then obey in verses two and three, uh, him. And we do so with a lightened heart because he's taken uh, our load, the load from us. And we, we allow him to, uh, the burden we carry is light because he's, he's there. He's carrying the big burden. We get to carry the light burden. So that is meant to be a comfort to these Christians who are feeling a role and others just the same way we do about what well, we have fears and concerns and, and so forth, but we can overcome this and it's been overcome for us by Jesus. So Jesus, uh, I should say John, weaves together faith, love and obedience uh, and intertwines them. And they are in a, a mutually, in a kind of a dynamic relationship uh, and become qualitatively the proof that, uh, you know, the love, the proof of love is obedience. Uh, the proof of faith is love. And they all kind of come one to the other. That makes sense to you. And so you haven't said anything about being born of God and verse uh, four, who is ever born of God overcomes the world. Born of God overcomes the world. They go to that anytime when you're starting to fret over things. And in the, in the eternal scope of things, God's got it all down. I mean, in this world, we're going to have tribulation because, uh, the world is groaning in travel and bad things happen. J Judy? Well, just back to when Rolly was mentioning uh, the fear that he had having to do with uh, things in their life, like our children. And I was been searching. I thought it was in one of the, the um, devotionals or something I had from the church today, but I guess I read it from one of the ones online I read. And I, this overcoming fear is, I don't worry for myself, but I worry for my children. And, you know, the, the, what I was reading this morning said, wait a minute, our faith, my faith has to say, you don't worry for yourself. Why do you worry for your children? Because they have faith. And it, overcoming, it, that's, a, that's a fear that overcomes I love God. He loves me. I know my children, grandchildren, and this helps me to accept some of these things. I mean, I have to keep reminding myself. <laughs> it, I hope I, I hope I've explained it. Yeah, you did a nice job, Judy. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, I, I look at it, I've got Sherry's there, one of my children. And the um, uh, way I look at it is uh, hopefully they, I, they saw something being modeled by their mother, their father when they were young. Uh, they saw something uh, uh, in the teachings that they had. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, whether that means they'll go to church every Sunday or not, that the real point is that they will be they will be overcomers uh, in their own right in their own way maybe quite a bit different than we are but still they, that and that's all we can do uh, because we yeah. cannot um, they our kids can't get to heaven on our apron strings well other th final comments on this uh, Another lively session, 30 minutes in the word, 15 I, minutes in counting. I love the verse, the peace that passes all understanding. Um, you know, and we can give our children blessings. We can, we can 
give them blessings and blessings are from the old testament too and they're very powerful but uh, there was a the last verse uh john 16 33 i have said this to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulations but be of good cheer i have overcome the world well, so Jesus so, did it. Good, so good marilyn on that <laughs> note would you lead us in a closing prayer oh sure Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this for this special time that Pastor gives us in the word. And tonight, as we were studying 1 John, how it talks about love, help us to know more the definition of God's love and, and how we can be closer to you, Lord, and have a close bond and relationship so that when tribulation trials come our way, we are anchored in your love. In Jesus' name, amen.